previous session, a policy for the arts. Um, as we all, I think all of you know, we are not living the easiest part, uh, times for the arts um, and culture at this moment. Um, we uh, saw that the budget for culture, support for culture, has suffered under a neoliberalist agenda for the last decades. We saw that more and more countries in Europe, the nationalist agenda is uh, more and more influencing the, um, the dissemination of the budgets for culture. And we still have many countries, many uh, countries in Europe where there's hardly any cultural policy developed yet. Uh, this session, we want to start with the European level and then go top down, national level, local level, knowing that if you want to advocate for the arts on European level, you also need <coughs> your advocacy uh, strategies on national and on local level. In the end, it are these people that are making the decisions on European level, are those people that are sent there from your own country. Um, I hope that we, um, in the end of this session, all have an impression of what would or could be our next step to get a better say in how cultural agendas in our countries uh, could be um, influenced by, us, by ourselves. Uh, have a better say, have a better tool, have some tools to have a say in the framing of the agenda. Uh, so I, in the end, I hope we can make it very practical and go to, in, uh, go to, to, to the level of some tips, some tricks, etc. We are very happy to have here Julie Ward and the team for labor uh, in the European Parliament. So the European Parliament member of the European Parliament. She would, um, she's willing to uh, give us advices, also share some of the recent developments, at least in the, in the labor part of the, of the Parliament, but um, probably you would can give us more insights in, in, in overall um, feelings at this moment about the cultural projects. But first of all, I want to give um, the word to my co-moderator, Hannah Luka, from uh, the Phoenix in Valencia, but also a very active member of Sendiac. And Sendiac started, uh, I think you are the initiators of, no? Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark, and just explain how this paper that you all found on your chair came to, came alive. Yes. Thank you and hello. Um, yeah, I, I just want to give a few contextual elements about the paper you have here. This um, uh, appeal uh, by the uh, European Alliance, Alliance for Culture. Um, so when we started, uh, I will tell you a little bit more about the week. Uh, two, I, I would say two years ago, singing and talking about the way we could advocate for the arts on the level of the European institutions, we were facing uh, some very concrete realities as uh, artistic and cultural operators. We had the feeling and that we were facing the reality that the arts and culture were going out of the radar of the European institutions more and more. Uh, that, that's the feeling we had. There were some operational programs uh, of the EU that stopped uh, supporting the, the, the culture funds like uh, the Interreg programs, which are uh, one of the programs of the European Regional Development Fund, ERDF, which is a fund that, as a matter of fact, is one of the most important funds for 
uh, operators or uh, cultural actors in border uh, regions. They give it was for us, for example, we are at the border to Belgium. It was much more important than the cultural program or Creative Europe program today. And so we were facing this reality. We have also had questions about the way the specific cultural program was evolving. It was cultural program, uh, now Creative Europe program, which uh, also uh, leads to some questions because the arts and culture disappeared behind this word Creative Europe. And this is also meaningful in a way. So we started asking ourselves, so we, um, for, my, if, for me it was uh, in the frame of saint which is a professional organization in France, we started to try to understand why this was happening and how it came to this. Um, and we had to face the fact that it was a logical consequence of the liberal priorities defined by the European Union in Lisbon in 2010 by the so-called 2020 or 2020 strategy for Europe that give, gave the European institutions, uh, the European Union political goals, binding priorities for all uh, European policies um, for the period going to, from 2010 to 2020. And culture, the arts and culture, was missing. It was not one of the European priorities. So various organizations, we started talking with, um, with ITM, with also with Pearl, and Anita Debar is the director of Pearl, uh, is here. Pearl is a, a, a big uh, a European network of uh, European employers in the field of performing arts, which uh, Anita will say more, I suppose. We started talking about all that, and uh, it's, it was uh, really felt that there were a lot of pe different people who started thinking that uh, we should go back to a stronger political advocacy on the level of European institutions. So uh, I will make it short, but we, at the end of the, this process of discussion, we had the idea that there would be two priorities as a consequence of what I said before. So trying to influence the operational programs of 2020, of the 2010 to 2020 period by answering to the midterm evaluation of, of this program. And there is a midterm evaluation process. And then maybe for the future, which is also very important, is the way we could influence the definition of the strategy for the European Union for the next period going from 2020 to 2030 which is starting now, in fact, which has already started. Um, so that the arts and culture become part, again, of the European Union's priorities and as a consequence of the operational programs that will be defined in the future. And, of course, what we feel, and that's why it's important that we talk about that today, if we want to reach this goal, so this is a text that is the result of this two-year process of discussion, and uh, it's a short text, but I can tell you it's, a, it's a, a, the result of a long process of discussion among a lot of people. Um, and today, uh, this text has been signed, I don't know exactly how many uh, European networks, 25 European networks, at this point it's open only to the European network, but there will be further steps, uh, have signed this, uh, this text. Okay. <laughs> you, you will. Um, so we feel that if we want to reach this goal, uh, we need you. We need all of us, in fact, <coughs> because we need to go and talk with uh, the people who will make, who will define the strategy tomorrow, which goes from the local level to the members of parliament, to the members of the European Parliament of your region, to the governments. Uh, of uh, the national governments to the Commission, all these levels, the more they will be aware of the, of the fact that we have this wish and that we think it's important for Europe, the, work, the, the more chance we will have to succeed. Of course, uh, the challenge is important. Uh, as Nan said, the rise of nationalist and liberal policies in Europe is emptying the European project right now. 
But that's precisely what we are offering Europe and its institution. We are offering uh, to give content and sense to a humanistic project, project that is today threatened by the selfish and nationalist, nationalist policies of the states, but also by the liberal policies of the Union itself. So, and that's my introduction, and I give the word to Yeah, before, before we get to go to Julie, um, I wanted to say that it is, uh, we are looking for endorsements of this appeal, and uh, uh, the, team, the email address <coughs> is on the first page, so we have the Alliance is 25 networks, but everybody, every person in Europe can, and also outside Europe, can endorse this letter, and the more uh, endorsements, the more
after the attacks in November, uh, the Italian Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, um, <coughs> said, they imagine terror, we answer with culture. They destroy statues, we love art. And he's um, now managed to get through his parliament um, a budgetary uh, line and promise to give youth 500 euros to spend on culture. Now, I want to talk about that partly because I think it's significant and important, but also because it doesn't go far enough, right? And sometimes the schematic responses of politicians don't really fit easily with the world that you live in and that I used to live and work in because I have been for all my life a cultural practitioner who used arts and culture for social change. I worked as a poet, a theatre maker, a cultural producer with the most marginalised communities. So I'm now in another world but I bring that practice with me. So whilst I love the fact that um, Renzi said those words, when I looked at the actual scheme, I found it very, very narrow. And I think the challenge is, um, not that politicians don't know, because they do know, you know? He, he, he's saying that and he knows it's actually true. And it's also in a very Italian response, you know, it's a, isn't it? Um, when the Italians held the presidency of the, of the parliament for the first six months, the whole six months of our debates and discussions were infused with art and poetry and cultural references, because that's just how they, that's just how Italians do things. It's in their DNA. But translating that into a policy <coughs> with a budget line can often then feel very cold, very limited, very restrictive. So that 500 euros, they said, that is for um, uh, 18 year olds to spend on cultural activities and events such as music, theatre performances, and trips to museums. And I would just like that 500 euros to be spent in a, a more interesting way for people to have more freedom about how they use that money and what they do with it. And I think that's where, where we need to make the difference. So we say, yeah, it's great that you think we're going to fight. Um, you know, we're going to oppose um, terrorists and the, and the populists and the nationalists by, uh, by saying we'll fight it with culture. Yes, because we can do that and we will do that. But actually, um, perhaps, the, <coughs> perhaps the artists themselves and the beneficiaries themselves would be better to give the, to give the ideas about how that 500 euros, whatever, could be spent. So I think we have some <coughs> acknowledgement, but putting things into a, um, a scheme is not all, always the answer. And when I was working in the arts, I, I was always so annoyed with government schemes because what they do is create a narrow framework for, uh, uh, for they create a narrow framework. And we know that art isn't narrow. We know that exploration um, and creativity is a journey. somehow that stops it from being its best, it stops it from being what it could be. Um, and the, it's on the, the most interesting things we know are happening on the periphery, they're happening, they're happening at, the day, at the sort of risky spaces, where, you know, that's where innovation takes place, that's where change happens. So I, would, I think we need to push, you know, and I can push from within my political group on this, but that's where we need to push. We need to encourage and say, yes, it's fantastic, but actually, is, you know, is, that, the, is that the right way for, that, for, for us to say that that money should be spent? So there is a commitment there. And the leader, I put Gianni up, because Gianni is the leader of the Socialists and Democrats in the Parliament, in the Parliament group, and obviously taking a lead from Renzi, um, has now said that we're going to make that um, a key a key commitment within the Socialists and Democrats. And I, this week, have been reading, uh, we're drafting a lot of new position papers within the S&D. Um, so we're, uh, we're at, you know, me as an MEP in that group, is able to make a strong contribution to that and to see where we can try and put, the, uh, and put this broader idea, this more creative idea, this more imaginative idea 
of what culture, what a cultural offer could look like within a political uh, strategic document. So it's just a little bit there. Am I able just to speak a bit more? <coughs> okay, because that, that was the bit I didn't plan, okay? <laughs> right, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about my, about, uh, my perspective on this. Um, this is taken from an article that's going to be published shortly. Um, so I hope that this will come up to some things that might be interesting. Now, when I, actually when, I, when I was elected, lots of people said to me, don't be on the culture committee because it's not important. <laughs> and if cultural activists and artists were telling me that, were saying to me, but you know I couldn't get on any other committee really because <laughs> nobody else wants to be on the culture committee. And I actually am happy to be on the culture committee because if, if people think it's not important, it's my job to make it important. And um, because I, I'm one of the few MEPs who's been an artist, there's two of us, Damien and me. Damien is a Romani musician. Um, he's a Romanian S&D um, uh, MEP. So both of us are in the culture committee and we have earned our living from being cultural practitioners. Committee, that we really, that we're really strong um, about that, and we, we work with other committees really closely to make sure that they know that culture is is fundamental. It's not an add-on. It's not a luxury. It is actually pivotal to everything that we're doing within um, within our institution. And we know that because when we're debating, sorry, I'm still not at the planned bit, but when we're when we're debating in the Parliament, and when stuff comes up, when reports come up, and uh, legislation comes up, anything that is about culture is the most contested uh, debate that we ever have. And um, I had a report on intercultural dialogue for uh, diversity and um, fundamental values uh, passed in the Parliament at the beginning of January. And all the right-wing populist, nasty extremist groups used my report as an excuse to bring up the Cologne attacks. Because they perceive that identity and culture right, is, 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 is being threatened for them. So anything that says we should talk to each other, we should have conversations, we should engage, we should exchange, Anything feels like a threat to that culture. Um, and in fact, my response, you can, wa and you can watch the, the bits of the debate, it's all televised if, you, if you're not aware and familiar. The European Parliament is actually a very open institution. Everything is filmed, you can watch it online. Um, and there's stuff on my website, some bits of the debate. And then at the very end, I, I make a speech that is a response to all the nasty stuff that we heard beforehand. And um, uh, I wanted to talk about what it might mean to be English uh, or British. And I always use the example of English folk culture and a specific form of English folk culture that my father engaged in, in fact, Mike knows about, which is Morris dancing. Right, Morris dancing is, um, you know, uh, guys with hankies and sticks and they jump about with bells and often have funny hats on. And it is a really archaic, <coughs> ancient form of culture, of cultural practice. But it probably is Moorish dancing, which comes from the Moors, which is from North Africa, which is Muslim. It is an Islamic cultural practice. So when the UKIP people and the racists say, we want our country back, we want our culture back, you know, we are English, oh, we must only have English culture. I say, what about Morris dancing? You know, that came. All you guys are terrified of and are now scapegoating and um, being xenophobic <coughs> about. So we have to, we have to remind people that culture is not fixed. Right, and if I just find, say a few things from here, and I actually say that in here. So those forces want us to believe that culture is fixed, that it's something, it's kind of throwback. 
And we have to challenge that by showing them that it's not. And we all know it's not. And young people are making new forms of culture all the time. Um, they don't, you know, they're borrowing from lots and lots of different practices. Um, so I think it's really important that we celebrate cultural diversity, that we empower marginalized communities through the arts and culture, and share a positive narrative on different cultures. And um, I think that is what should be the ultimate purpose of the European cultural policy. Um, that culture should be, um, uh, should strive to help create a more open, inclusive, participatory and cooperative model of democracy for the 21st century. And culture should be recognized as being a, a shared resource and a public good, not a separate policy subject. Um, and that this uh, belief that I have in intercultural dialogue, cultural diversity, cultural diplomacy <coughs> are, fundament, are, are the really important tools that we have in order to face the current challenges. Um, well, because there is a question. Yeah, yeah. Continue on this topic. I think now it's very important for us to, to see how, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's very impressive the way you are, and I'm very happy that you are um, a person coming from culture, so you're still, I just didn't know uh, what you're talking about. Um, the question is how can we support how do you think the arts field, we, ITM participants, could support your plea for cultural budgets? <coughs> Is there any power in the massive group of artists and arts professionals to support policymakers uh, to make a stronger case for cultural budgets? Now we see, in a way, what ha what helps us now are re refugees and terrorists. Mm -hmm. These are not the alliances that we, we those are not the people that we want to have our, as our strongest allies. We would like to have a political constituency yeah. um, making a case for culture <coughs> as such, for, for arts as such, for, and, and yeah, how would we? Is there is there a way we could? I'll just talk about some of the ways that people can engage more with with politicians. Yeah. Um, I think um, I don't know how many of you lobby us on an individual basis or on a group basis, but we are lobbied all the time. And I think maybe the arts world needs to get better at lobbying. And what that means is making relationships with us. Some of the best lobbyists basis. And um, uh, so we follow their work. Uh, we um, have regular meetings with them. They email us stuff that they're up to. And when we're asked, to propose um, experts for group hearings or we, or we want evidence with which to challenge the commissioners or we want evidence to um, base a report on or legislation on. If we are able to evidence that because we have relationships with people, actually that's very powerful and that's how my report was done. And also, when the commissioner, when the commissioners were uh, 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 were in um, was, when, when the commission was established in the first um, <coughs> autumn of my legislature, legislature which is uh, 2014, um, we we were able to ask the commissioner the the commissioner elect questions before we agreed whether or not we were going to uh, vote for him and. I put out a call to lots of cultural organisations saying, what do you want, what questions do you want me to ask? So my relationship with the, with the sector and with other politicians and with the institutions 
is to be very consultative and participative. Right? Now, I know that's how I do things. I don't know if that's how other people do things. But I think we could that's make it. Yes, I reach. am, I know. <laughs> but, you know, we could make it so. I think what's interesting, I mean, I was never in politics before, so I, I don't know how it works, really, in anywhere else. I only know how it works in, in Europe, and I only know how it works for me, and I'm making it up. But what I perceive already is that I'm able to bring a different energy into the Parliament because of my grassroots contacts, because of the networks and the organisations that I'm working with. And so whenever there's a proposal or a call, a call for proposals for experts, for pilot projects, for example, for ideas, for visits, for cultural visits, and MEPs go on cultural <coughs> visits to see things and see people, right? What I do is troll through all the organisations that I know, or put a call, literally put a call out to people. And people respond, and we then propose that. Lots of my proposals have been taken up. And I wondered, first of all, why that was. Is it because nobody else is making proposals? Or is it because my proposals are so different from everybody else? <coughs> A lot of the expert group hearings previously seemed to be academics speaking, people from universities doing research, bringing their evidence. And whilst I've got a great deal of time for academics, it's not, pra it's not always practice-based. Um, and the best academics that come are the academics that come from a practice base who are working in the real world. But most of, most of my experts that I bring are actually people and real people and real projects. And when I speak in Parliament, in debates, or whenever when I'm writing about things, I'm using real people and real projects. And I discovered, um, I brought, I was going to show this thing now, here. If you go back to news, I'll find it. So I think one of the things that you need to do, if you go to news, I'll find it for you. Yeah? One of the things that you need to do is find out who your MEPs are and invite them to things. And also ask them, tell them you're going to come. All the committees are open, that you can be there. You can watch what's happening. You can't make any, can't ask any questions. But if you're, but you can ask your MEPs to ask questions on your behalf. And I think there's always a power as a politician if you say, if you talk about real projects. So this last week, for example, Jaffa, um, yeah, uh, Jaffa here is um, uh, one of my constituents who um, I proposed his work, his project for European Citizens Award, and won and then came to Parliament and has been back since subsequently for a number of projects, is now working across lots of different new networks with young people in Bosnia. And that project in Bosnia, I used as an example in the speech about the, the accession process for Bosnia in the Parliament <coughs> on um, last week. And there's a power in that, right? There's a power in me being able to see the complete <coughs> freedom of truth arts project in Srebrenica, working in a pan-European way, which won an award and was funded, it, there's a power in that. So I think what, one of the things that you need to do is to make sure you have relationships and that you batter on that door of your elected representatives and let them know who you are and what you're doing. Um, can I just, sorry, a few more answers, because we are establishing in the Parliament an anti-austerity left caucus, which I hope will have culture at the heart. It's not a new group. It <coughs> comprises of Greens, Socialists and Democrats, and the GUI NGL group, which if you don't know that group is like um, Syriza Podemos, um, the Nordic left group. And we are gathering together um, a group of MEPs who are firmly anti-austerity um, to propose a new, some new models um, for Europe. That's another hopeful thing. Uh, can I just ask you a question um, related to uh, this question of the definition of the next <coughs> strategy of the priorities of the European Union for the next period? 
are you aware of the way it will work and how do you think the parliament and um, maybe the cultural company, commission can um, will be asked to, to put, have some input into that or is it something you already working on it, which is why we're doing those strategy documents. Yeah. Yeah? So uh, I presume all the other groups are doing the same. Um, so um, th those, uh, for example, we're looking at putting children at the heart of policy. You know, what, do, what, does, what, does the world, what does the world look like if you build, if you build policy <coughs> around a child, around children's needs and young people's needs? What does that look like? So it's education in education or it's a culture no. for children? Um, well, again, it's, it's culture in education. No, no, I'm not talking about culture. I'm just saying, for example. Oh, no. okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. And I have to say, culture doesn't stand, there's no, there isn't a paper about culture, right? But it's my job, Sylvia Costa's job, and all the other S and Damien's job to make sure that culture is in that strategic paper in lots of ways, not just in one way, yeah? And how can we help you when you will really be <laughs> trying to visit the person and other people to get culture into this strategic paper, papers? Um, well, the it's a good time to be lobbying now because these documents are being, are being written. So, um, so I would suggest that people, that people do send, uh, do, do communicate, um, and I mean, give, the, the thing is, give examples. And I don't think this is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think we need the quantitative stuff anymore. People say we do, but you know, we've proven this case. In fact, we've proven it in euros, we've proven it in, in jobs, we've proven it in, in GDP, we've proven it in visitor numbers. We've done all that, actually. It's narrative It's now. narrative. It's the stories, but right? But this means you call your MEP? Yeah. You ask for... I think what you should do, right? For they, I think you should do. I think you should invite MEPs to see... I, I know Jeff as well because I turned up, right? I, and because he's a fantastic lobbyist. Right, put your hand up so people can see you. <laughs> yeah. So I know. This guy, right? okay. this knows guy, this guy knows, knows how to do it. Okay? okay? He knows how to do it. You bother them. You bother your MEPs. You make them feel important as well, okay? Right? But you bother, you bother, it didn't matter to me, but you bother them, you invite them to things, you want them to meet your constituents, right? And Jack works with some of the most marginalised um, Asian young people in one of the poorest ex mill towns in, in Lancashire. And those young people have been transformed through your work, for sure. And I was really proud when, when, when you won that award. But what I've done is I've gone to the events. I've met the young people. Not only did I go to your award ceremony, I turned up in the middle of the Lake District, in the middle of nowhere, when the young people were um, on a residential for a week, out orienteering. But you're yeah. intrinsic yeah, interest. I know. And not everybody is. Yeah. But Anna, can we, can we, can we open? Um, They've got a boat and they made films about the sea and they did all sorts of amazing stuff. Turned up in my office with a, a one-man show performance that they do. Right? I, now they're going to be with me speaking in Manchester at the European Science event. Right? They came to my office right, with their stuff. And you know, our lives, as I, I left an exciting life working in the theatre and poetry. And you know, cultural change and activism. So when somebody turns up 
to perform or offers me an opportunity to do something that's not just writing amendments or dealing with difficult constituents, actually, I'm going to love that and I'm never going to forget it. So I think you, you really have to try and some people will never see you or never, you know, but there, I think there are a lot more who would really welcome the relationships with you because arts is feel-good stuff, right? It makes us feel good, right? We're human beings, right? We're starved of it. So, you know, give us more. Um, hi, I'm Anna I'm I'm sorry to be confrontational or uh, provocative, but actually, uh, you said at the beginning that culture always uh, pulls the shortest straw, and uh, it's true. So, for instance, the cultural committee in Hungarian parliament is led by the Neonazi Party's mm -hmm. representative. Um, and in fact, in the European Commission, uh, the commissioner is the Hungarian yes. people, <coughs> and we wrote to you, we wrote a letter from, in the name of the um, Association of Independent Performing Artists, and we protested very strongly against, we summarized the reasons why we shouldn't take this job. You also had protests from within the parliament, uh, several parties, several coalitions, and you had uh, also a protest letter with big names, international names, and it didn't matter at all, so sorry. It did if matter. I, if, I, if I'm skeptical, but nothing happened, and the Hungarian, the representative of a very authoritarian government, which is really killing Carter and bleeding it out in Hungary, became the person who's responsible um, it's not entirely true, all right, what we didn't do. We didn't, in the committee, we voted against him. So I don't know how far you followed the process, but we voted against him in the committee. Right, I, it's very technical what happens in Parliament, okay? The commission has to be voted as a whole commission. It cannot be voted individually by the Parliament, all right? In the Culture Committee, we voted against him. We gave him a really hard time asking him your questions, and we didn't like his answers. And we said, we don't want you, we vote against you. So he was not our vote. However, they fiddled about with it and they took away citizenship from him, all right? And then they said, he's probably good to go. We said, no, it's not good enough, right? We don't like that either, okay? Why should, if he's not good enough for citizenship, is he any good for art? No, patently not. So we still protested. But by this time, it was, all, um, I think Parliament had almost been there six months. We hadn't done any work. Um, because you cannot progress the process unless, until you've got the commission constituted. So in the end, the commission was constituted, despite the fact there was an issue with him and there was an issue with the environment, yeah. um, the environment commissioner. And we were not happy with that. So when you attack, um, I am not the person to attack because we stood up against it. But we had to vote the commission because otherwise nothing would happen. Budgets weren't being released for films. Projects were, uh, there was lots of ESF money that wasn't getting delivered and all the rest of it. But if you want to go on my official website, sorry, this is my nice website, if you go on my parliamentary page, you look at the explanation of my vote that day, you will see that I criticised the commissioner in my explanation of vote. So you still have the opportunity to be very critical and understand the process and say that you don't like it and that you're not happy about this, this is what you've done already. But ultimately, we, I felt, also my group, that we couldn't hold up the process anymore. Okay? So that's the, that's the technicality of it. I would like to uh, to switch. If there's one more urgent question for Julie Ward, <coughs> after that I will switch to the national level to see what we, because I think apart from that we all want to raise the position of culture on the European level, I think there are many questions raised now on national level as well. Here's one urgent well, question we get from I, you. Maybe I can, uh, it's nice to make a linking pin there actually, um, because in the European context, the European Commission is the sole <coughs> body that can propose legislation. Mm -hmm. The Commission is a very small entity, it doesn't have that much personnel. Which means that there are policy groups, 
with national public servants, they discuss, they come up with the policy. <coughs> if you want to influence, like, pragmatically the European policies, you have to go to your national public servants that are, are in the European coordination uh, committees that produce the policy proposals. Then we have the policy proposals. Then we have to match them with an urgent political problem so we can have members of parliament actually gain popular support for the policy proposals already there. If you start with popular support, you're too late with your policy proposal. That's how Europe works. First the policy proposal, then the popular support. I, yeah. Can you write us down <laughs> <laughs> the steps? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's, I happen to be also a public administration scholar. So uh, can I just say, yeah. that, that, yes, yeah. that's great when you have a receptive, when you have a, I, very difficult for me, right? You know, the UK government. That's different. UK and the Hungarian government. Yeah. yeah, very difficult. So you have to find some other yeah. routes, all right? I understand that. I, you know, my, my government does not speak for me and will never, ever <laughs> take up the things. My, the, the Conservatives in the European Parliament voted against my report on intercultural dialogue. I right? voted against it. So, I, you know, the policies I'm trying to propose, and it's passed with a big majority, so it just shows you what we're up against. Yes, you can do that, but you can't just do that. No, I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's you need to do both, but yeah. I mean, you have to have the ideas in place yeah. first so just before you tell them. That might be useful. Yeah? Sure. Um, yeah? In the Parliament, we also have intergroups, okay? So, as well as the 20 standing committees, and I would say, work, with, work across other committees as well. That's really, really important. Don't just stay in um, the cult committee. Um, foreign affairs is becoming more and more important. So my office is really active in foreign affairs now because, um, you know, <laughs> what are we going to do about, about the security threats and, and all the rest of it? So it has been very much recognised that culture, engagement with young people, not just tackling the effects of extremism and radicalization, but looking at the causes. And when I say extremism and radicalization, I also mean the extreme groups like uh, Pegida, EDL, right? I'm talking about on all sides. Um, it's really been recognized that um, culture has a massive role to play in foreign affairs, in diplomacy, in peace building, in, uh, in, in conflict resolution. And so um, there's a big meeting in Brussels next week at uh, the Culture uh, Forum, uh, all around that issue. And um, we have to be stronger about that so the, the High Representative takes it on board because there's sometimes, again, it's, sometimes the idea of culture in foreign affairs is just a bit like, well, a whole load of um, really important um, buildings got destroyed and we've got to deal with that. But actually, it's not just that. We know it's not just that. It's about people, it's about people and expression and all the rest of it. So working in other committees is important. Um, employment, working in the employment, uh, 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 trying to affect the employment committee is really important as well in terms of skills. The skills agenda is really important. Um, and um, there are intergroups. So outside of the 20 committees, there are um, intergroups which are cross-party. And these get established because certain things fall through the gaps. So I was a co-founder of a children's rights group in the parliament. And what the intergroups can do is really interesting because they can often lay the ground for some for, for, for policy, they can often lay the ground for uh, legislation, for pilot projects, for a whole load of other initiatives and campaigns that Parliament won't pick up. Also in terms of trying to mainstream some of the things. So with the children's rights stuff, what we want, what we'd like to do is to mainstream that across all the committees in the same way that we do gender mainstreaming. So there are, I'm just trying to think of the, um, so we don't we don't focus on those MEPs that have the uh, culture in their in their uh, no you do well. I you, mean, you you can go to you do need to focus on them because some people are put in culture and they don't understand it. All right, seriously, some people are in the culture committee and they don't get it. Some people are in the culture committee and they only think culture is sport. Okay, yeah. So it, actually, you do have to because. Uh, it, you know, some, 
some of the people in the culture committee, they seriously, you know, educate them, right? But also look across those wider, look across those wider committees. And then the intergroups, um, there's loads of them. There, there, is, there is one on um, cultural industries, um, and it would be really good to challenge that intergroup a bit about what cultural industries are doing, could be doing, should be doing, and um, uh, just you know, different models, I suppose, really. But um, like my intergroup, the children's rights intergroup, is you know we've certainly got um, ways we can work. Uh, there's also, I'm just trying to think of other ones, common goods, sorry, that's really important. There's a common goods and public services intergroup, and we, I hosted a, um, a meeting um, on radical democracy, which used photojournalism, filmmaking, um, citizen journalism, all sorts of stuff um, that, that had happened. So these are other ways to get in, get in. and again, we, we bring experts in, we bring people in to speak to us, we post events, we can do that, okay? so don't just leave it up to the committees and, the, and, and you know, in, in culture, there's all that other stuff. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, I, I think uh, you're right, and uh, that's all the discussion we also had with Pearl, that it, what's, uh, maybe we give the word to Anita to talk a little bit about this, but it's easier to have a paragraph on culture in the strategic uh, documents if they have been the initial proposal than to bring them in later. So maybe uh, I know Pearl uh, is, has very uh, often contact with the commission, is working with them on a regular basis, and so they're going to try to do this work. But then uh, I, I propose to give the work to Anita, but what we would like to open also as a discussion, because is um, that we have a few people who will talk about their local context or the way they lobby in their own countries on a national or on a local level because um, the idea also of the output of this session um, ITM would like to maybe to to see what the needs are to advocate best on your national level so that maybe we can work on a on a toolkit um, just to give you an example of one thing and then I will the work what we did in, in France on this spe specific project in the professional organization Sandek in which I active, we have regional uh, representatives, so people who have uh, direct access to the local authorities and also to the members of parliament on a regional basis. So we send out uh, uh, a letter that they can use to get in contact, uh, we give, gave them some arguments to talk with their politicians. So this is a toolkit we did on a national basis, but maybe there could be but maybe not, maybe the local contexts are so different and uh, we, so we don't know. So, um, do we get the word first to, 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 okay, to Judith and then to Sorry, okay, just, I just, uh, some of you know this already, but I spoke as ITM about it before, but we, we, about five or six years ago, we, we had the same conversation over and over again in the UK and we got like together it. and, uh, started a thing, it's not an organisation, it's a thing called What Next for the Arts. And it was it started being an hourly meeting at the Yandrick Theatre every Wednesday morning from half past eight to half past nine. What was impressive about it for me, it was the first time in my many years of working in the arts, I had seen all art forms and all scales of art organisations working together from an individual artist to the opera house to galleries, museums, things. It's fascinating, it's one hour, it's a bit like going to the gym on a Wednesday morning. It really does 
chapter is really interesting. It's wider than just arts funding. It's about, it's about culture, it's about politics, <coughs> it's about all this. Lots of content about climate and refugees, but where we sit in the arts world. And it's very optimistic, despite the fact that all our governments are doing their best to make us the opposite. So I would urge you to have a look at the website if you don't know about it. I think it's what the next culture, culture dot com, something like that. But it's quite easy to look at. So it's what we're doing nationally, and I think it's made. Okay, uh, so now we, we, we already jumped to the national level. I think that is better we do Sorry. first do the, the national level, and then we come back to, uh, to Anita, so we end up with Europe again. Um, I think there are more good examples here of people who already did some jobs in organizing their own field as in, in, to support uh, or to, to, to make a lobby uh, lobbying body. Um, yes? Um, I would like to... I'm from Hungary also, from Budapest, and I joined ICA in 1991. Yeah. And before that, uh, I just wanted to say uh, I was very so, uh, sad about that. The same thing is going on for 25 years, that we have to be good friends of the politicians to do something. So what happened to me, in 89, there was a change. In 88, uh, I got money from the Soros Foundation to build a theater in Budapest. And then there was Christina Baba in the Ministry of Culture, <coughs> whom I met because she was a Polish translator and I had a play translated by her, so I knew her. And she was working for the Cultural Ministry. And then she told me, why don't we go to the Ministry of Finances, to the Minister of Finances, to have the, well, I don't know how is it in English, but they, they, they short or pay to the budget, uh, to have a budget night for uh, uh, theatres which are not in, in the structure, not the state theatres. But at the same time I feel sorry and sad and terrible that we have to do that. And now, uh, there is nobody we can talk to. I mean, I don't want to talk to. Maybe you can, I don't know. Maybe you should. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in fact, I know uh, um, excuse me, of this Association of Independent Performing Arts. Which I founded. So. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in 1990. Okay. And, and I know that at this point in time, we are a very a small minority, like you know Hungary and Poland and possibly the UK. I don't know in, in a different way, but but I think it's 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 essential. And I know many of you will disagree at this point. <coughs> there has to be a way where we can skip the national level, where we can join forces on the European level. And we can, <coughs> where we can find a way to talk to European um, MPs and, and other responsible parties. Because uh, as, as I personally, and also running my own theatre, I would never speak to the government. But as co-chair of this association, I, f I felt that my job was different because I had to speak up for all the members. So I did. And we did, um, we have three co-presidents or whatever, co-chairs. And uh, we spent four months negotiating with the ministry and um, they were uh, just about not even more money but about the, for the first time in life uh, about announcing the call on time in November rather than March because what happens is you get your, uh, your money for any calendar year in around September so I mean that's a huge problem and you don't find out until May whether you're going to get anything at all. So you can't even plan and you can't even borrow because you don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, so we talked to them. We had serious negotiations and they were really nodding the whole time as if they understood <coughs> some key points, not many, like five key points and none of them about more money, which we desperately need. And as it turned out, they were lying through the teeth and they came out, the, the call came out later last year and it was less than last year and, and none of it was true. So in fact, we ended up spending four months using all our energy, all our time, all our resources. Of course, none of this is paid work, I, 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 I don't have to add that properly, which we could have spent 
you know, joining forces with everyone else, with Poland and with other countries where it doesn't make a lot of sense trying to talk to the politicians. So sorry, I know we're a minority, but I, I will keep repeating this until we, we try and join forces. Thank you. May I ask her a question? <laughs> Just, just from a personal curiosity, in those four months of negotiation, every time you had a meeting, yeah. did you, after the meeting, write them a letter yeah. summarizing? Yeah. Yeah. So you had things on paper? Email, yeah. but yeah. yeah. I mean, it because this is important, that always you remind them, when you have met with them, remind them what you talked about, about, what they were saying, etc. Because otherwise, they can always come back to, oh, well, I didn't say this but or that. See, in our country, they would say one thing one day, and then they would laugh and we'd say exact opposite the next day. It's one of the things that we and now we're, we've always been uh, in peace with Eurasia. So. Mm -hmm. How many people in the room have the impression they can't work on national level because it's no use to work on national level? That's, a really That's good what question. you say. That's a really good question. How many people are there? Yeah. So much. <laughs> Bulgaria, Hungary. <laughs> Poland is still possible to. <laughs> <laughs>
that you do not have the language in which to speak, so you ask politely, can we have a glossary or a dictionary, please, so we can use the language. They declined to give us this. So we carried on with our narrative. We managed to um, take back some cuts that were given to us last year. I don't know how. They weren't cuts that were sanctioned by Westminster, or they were just extra cuts. So in 2015, we should have really given a 16% cut on an arts budget that's less than 13 million for the whole of Northern Ireland. And it would have seen the end of quite a few of the companies across the board. We managed to get some of it back. So far, it looks like a victory. Then at the end of last year, they did away with the Department of Culture. So now we don't have a Department of Culture or Arts and Leisure in Northern Ireland anymore. We've been subsumed into communities and citizenship. So what we have is we live in a part of the UK which is being lashed in terms of culture. It's being used to further agendas, very political, a lot of them. Um, and even when you do meet on an ongoing basis, and we're wide open to continuing to meet, to be honest with you, you're stonewalled or you're shut down. So any advice that I can get from any of you guys that we can bring back, we use or whatever else, is great for you to see. Sometimes even when we lose. Yep. <coughs> Since I'm around very quickly, I would like to go back a little bit to Barry's meeting. Uh, because I think uh, it's, I, I suggest you, you read the report because it's really well done. Uh, and we Let me explain yeah. just one minute. We had a ITM organized a satellite meeting last month in Paris where we brought together representatives from the arts field and policy makers and researchers and so arts councils, ministries, research institutions and the arts field to discuss uh, the cultural policy uh, <coughs> topics of today. Uh, we have to come with indicators, but could artists uh, be a partner in deciding which indicators should be measured if we want to evaluate the arts? Um, how could we involve uh, artists in decision-making processes? And is this measuring of impact, is that a way we should go or should we totally quit with that because the real value of art is not measured <coughs> in the way we normally measure impact. Yeah. This was our meeting. So and there's a good report, as you say, on our website. Yes, uh, and it's very well done. I, I suggest you will be with it. Uh, and so going back to, to that, it was the first moment, I would say, that the two uh, organizations, the representatives of the artists, work together with a representative of the Ministry of Culture. It was the first moment we worked with three, three of us together. So uh, it was a first moment, and it was very important uh, in terms of, of that of the informal situations and conversations. Um, so going back a little bit further to that, uh, we were discussing a lot about the intrinsic value of arts and how do we measure <coughs> and uh, the, the long-term impact of, of <coughs> that intrinsic value. So which are the new arguments uh, related to, to art uh, how, and how can we use them uh, in relation to the policy makers. Uh, in Portugal, like in many other countries, we pass uh, those moments of the measuring. We measure number of audiences, number of performances, and later, lately the economical impact of art, which is very important, and it gave us uh, some arguments. Um, Going on a bit uh, to this relation, uh, of course, it's, it depends a lot on people, who is there and how open they are to, to, to listen to us. So it's a building of trust, but first they have to go, or they have to open, they have to receive us. Um, so lately we are uh, finding a very good, uh, I think we have a, a good situation now in Portugal. First, we have a ministry of culture, and we have for, I think, eight years. 
Uh, so we have now for four months. We just dismissed, but we have another one this week. So, uh, so it's always starting from the, the zero point. But um, uh, so uh, this building of trust, uh, I think we are we are uh, in a good a good way uh, in this relation. I have three uh, suggestions uh, to. Uh, the things that are already happening. One thing is the uh, research, uh, because uh, it is uh, proposed by uh, to the faculty of economy faculty. Uh, they did a study in Portugal on the economical impact some years ago, and now uh, they were suggested to do uh, another uh, study on the in, in intrinsic impact of uh, culture. Uh, so this is one uh, thing that I hope it's going to happen. Uh, another suggestion is that it's, there is uh, 600 people here, I think. So 600 people spreading the world. It's a lot. It's many countries. So it's easy. Uh, we don't have to do this uh, every day or lunch time or every time, but uh, I think it's, we will do a big way. I will say. Uh, yeah, so talk about art. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to spread the word about uh, the, the, this paper that uh, it's. possible to, to advocate for culture in France, actually. Um, it's not only a question of uh, financial crisis, because we are facing, we are actually at the end of a 30 years process of decentralization that hasn't been decided just in the last years. And uh, we had also a few elections in the regional level, in the department level, in the, the city level, and we, we have to face many, many new elected without any idea about political about policy, about political issues and projects. These, these are the, the, the problems actually. And this decentralization process has made that the state transferred many competencies to local authorities. These competencies, competencies are healthcare, transportation, etc. And these are obligatory competencies. Culture is optional competence. Do you see what I mean? I mean, culture is over today in France. We are facing many, many budget cuts, but we'll have more and more in the coming years. And I don't know what will happen. In my organization, the only thing we, we could do is um, I'm coordinating a network of regional uh, art councils. <coughs> this shortly. Um, we decided to ask different uh, professional networks and elected networks to organize some meetings. We have two in this year, one in June, and to see how this new um, decentralization process is opening some, some new dynamics and new cooperation process. And we asked them to come to a meeting in June and in October. And I don't know if it will succeed in anything in this way, but uh, that's the only way we could, if we think it was uh, relevant to do something. And I'm not sure, um, well, uh, you're, 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 you're interested in the fact that maybe um, the European Parliament is to reflect of the local elective. And where we have to fight is then to, to train uh, to uh, educate uh, is local and elected to get more and more involved with good politicians, I think. Well, that's me, uh, Julie, because I, I also had the impression now that maybe it's not always uh, national to European, but maybe it's both, it's indeed local to European more, but it's also that maybe 
is there any power in Europe to influence on the national levels? Because when I hear so, there are many national uh, policies now that are taking the wrong direction. I mean, the British perspective is very difficult at the moment, obviously, because we have one of the most right-wing conservative governments that we've seen in a long time, who um, are now embroiled in the most ugly, awful um, political battle for leadership. And um, not really, and there's a great, I have to say there's great fear in Britain about, um, about talking um, about Europe too much. And, you know, I, I, I would prefer more, more Europe, not less. You know, I, I, I gave up my other life to defend the Europe that I believe in, even though, uh, you know, which I've experienced through the arts and culture. That was my journey into politics. Um, so I, but, uh, and certainly, um, and certainly back home, um, a lot of, um, actually, I think that local councillors, in a way, might be more persuadable than MPs, the national politicians. And that's because they are often, they're the people who are having to make the decisions about whether or not to close the library, or to close the art gallery, or to amalgamate two organisations that previously were one. And so I, I do think that at a very local level, um, and also, as MEPs, we have very strong relationships with a lot of local politicians. They come out to Parliament on missions, we meet them, we go to their meetings back home. I, I hardly know any of the Labour MPs. I mean, I wasn't in politics before, so that's partly the reason, but even so, two, two years, you'd think I would know them, wouldn't you? You'd think I would know who they are. So there is, I think, I think that local and, and European actually could work quite, that is working quite well together. When, when local politicians come out to see our work, the European Parliament can actually support um, visits, organised visits by groups, there's subsidies to do that, to give people travel, help with travel costs and accommodation and subsidy. And where, certainly when people have been out and had those experiences and uh, met people, looked at committees, seen some of the work, they supported in my, in my office um, a group of young artists um, who all work through an organisation called Panda, Performing Arts Network Development Agency in the Northwest, and who actually decided they don't want to have any core funding from the government because they'd like to be critical, and I think that's a really interesting, quite a strong position to take, and they've managed to be very enterprising and entrepreneurial about how they get lots of different funds together to um, to, uh, to continue. And in fact, I ran an organisation that never ever had any core funding, so I know you can do it. But um, when those young people came out, they didn't really know about Europe, they didn't understand about it, they didn't even, I don't think they even met any politicians. They came out and spent two days in Brussels. Um, we connected them with other arts organisations in Brussels. Their confidence levels have, have really risen, and they've become advocates for, if you like, a different Europe. And I, I think that's the thing. I'm not here to defend the Europe that we all are scared of and hate and are fighting at the minute. I think we have to find ways. I think we have to find ways to to push for this. You know, to push for a, a, a more social Europe and a Europe that is a Europe that works for people. So we're in a very hard place at the minute, you know? And, I, I, and a little bit of me, actually, I kind of say is a bit, a little bit of me is a bit frustrated at, at the sector because I think, I think we're in such a dangerous situation at the minute that I think we should be turning some of our attention, actually, to those extremists who will destroy really what they, they don't want any of the things that we care about. They don't want any of those debates, those discussions, those relationships, 
those, those imaginations, that vision, that creativity, that celebration. They don't want any of that. And I think right now is the time for more people to be political, right? Uh, I would like to see more people actually do what I did. It's hard, it's tough, it's intense, but actually, it's right now, it's important that there are more different, wider, diverse voices. People standing up for what you believe in, for what I believed in, for what I did for 30 years. Because otherwise, no, who else is going to do it? Who else is going to do it if you don't do it? Right? Me and, Rick, me and um, Damien by ourselves, we need more of you, actually. I'd like to see more people doing what we did. That's a very good call. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Christoph, you want to? You always have a kind of positive uh, example of how you can organize yourself to make a stronger force. And I think uh, since we have a few minutes left, I give you the mic to explain what you did in Berlin. so many things of countries where politically it really changes to the not bad, but to the very, very bad one. In Poland, I think, is a huge catastrophe. It's a so close neighbor to uh, Germany where collaboration started to, 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 to be better and better. And now this Hungary is another example. So um, I guess this is a speech from Berlin. Um, I'm speaking only from Berlin and not on the national level. Because uh, uh, it's difficult because there, there is enormous money, so the country is very rich. Um, there, the political system, at least until now, is quite stable. But we see the first um, very, very dark clouds with the with AfD, with Pegida, um, with the elections, that things may change. I think in Berlin, we have this story of the development since war, the, the war broke down. And then we have this, we believe with this coalition of independent scene where we start to sit together. And I think, so a couple of things, we learned from there was that united we are stronger <coughs> than divided. So this is a uh, Dumbledore said that. Um, <laughs> but it's it's a very but it really worked because when we were divided, the, politi the, the politicians or the, 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 the executive power, which is one unit, which is one administration, just naturally, not because they were mean, but just naturally they are sitting in one <coughs> office and we from the different arts go there and from different fields. So as long as we don't speak with each other. I mean, you yeah, being united in different art forms. So if literature, literature goes there and speaks with the politicians, it's one thing. Then theatre goes there, performing arts, and dance goes there, then visual art goes there. And, and since we don't speak with each other, it's just natural. It's not even by being mean, but it's natural that we fall apart and we don't know what thing. We cannot control them, what they say or what the politicians say and what they do and how they act about them on us. So being united beyond the boundaries of different art practices works quite, quite well. And we thought at the beginning this was not possible because a visual artist is working in such a different way than a theater artist or a dancer is so different from, a, from someone who makes literature. And that's true, there are collective arts, there are individual arts, that's true. But all these arts have a time of preparation, of research, of um, thinking about something. All these arts have a second time of production, whether it is writing or rehearsing or painting or whatever. And all these arts have a time of presentation, whether it is the show that you do or it is the book that you have printed. So why not apply things that work in different arts well, apply the program in, in Berlin, where they give a lot of money to, to rent at least for visual artists. Well, maybe this doesn't really work for other arts. Or there is a good system to fund independent theatres. Of course, there's always not enough money, so we always have to say it's not enough money, but it actually <laughs> works not so bad. So, um, but this, for example, doesn't work for publishing houses, because they say small lyrics, contemporary lyrics of contemporary literature, houses that have uh, editions of 200 books, <coughs> they never will make money, That's because it's an, edit, uh, an edition, like a publish house, they say it's, a, uh, it's an economical entity. Can I fund that? So the logics within um, the funding systems are not really well developed. Systematizing would, would help them. I, I personally don't like speaking of culture 
I think I know it's cultural, it's cultural things and all that, but I think I, I prefer speaking of arts, and I think you should be very, very precise in always, always speaking of arts, 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 and artistic production, artistic critiques, instead of culture. We have a very beautiful culture of, of, of Rathaus in Germany, or we have also a very beautiful, uh, it's not a, not a very beautiful culture, of burning houses of refugees. It's one every night, so we do that very consequently. We don't speak so much in the press about This is also part of our receiving culture that we don't speak about. We, speak, we should, I think, speak about art. And I think we should be very, very distinct, but I think this is common ground here, not speak about create, creative businesses or creative cluster or something like that. And I, this is something I really hope that we can achieve, that it is being speaks of in the European Parliament. It's about art, it's not about creativity or creative businesses or a cluster or something like that. We should keep art and the artistic production there as such, not as part of creative businesses, because then, then we're getting completely lost. One thing that was always very difficult if you come together and speak, and you certainly all know that, um, if you're just speaking of one artistic field, is that it very fast is a discussion, discussion about how good is this, how bad is that. So you speak about quality, then you speak about um, is this um, yeah, maybe conservative, conservative um, let's say theater makers that say progressive contemporary theater, this is not really theater, this is performance or something like that. I think if we're speaking of cultural policy, I use the word culture again, I know, but if we're speaking of cultural policy, that prevents <coughs> us from speaking about the quality of art because we have quality problems everywhere. It's business like that, it's policy, it's in our health system, it's our school system. So putting, taking the quality problem as our problem is just wrong, it's everywhere. And so not speaking about art, <coughs> what is art and what is not art, it's about cultural policy. And I think in keeping these things very clear and in keeping the words very clear, that helped us a lot. In Berlin they spoke very long about the alternative scene, they spoke very long time about the off scene, um, that implies that it is young, that implies that it is emerging, that implies also that this is not young anymore and maybe not emerging anymore, that it is failed. So um, all these words emer um, emerging or you know, off or alternative, we try We don't speak of off scene anymore or of alternative scene, we speak of freie scene, of independent art, <coughs> and independent in the question of funding, of course, in opposition, and I don't mean in an like unfriendly opposition, but in a logical opposition of institutionally funded art. So independently funded art is one thing, <coughs> institutionally funded art is another thing. And this, keeping this word, the independent art as such, helped us to accept that this is a serious way to work. <coughs> Actually, the thing of saying this is emerging art and you want to, or your alternative art and you want to take over a theater or an institution works for theater, for dance, but how would it work for visual arts, for example? Where is a museum with an ensemble of visual artists? So logically it doesn't work, but we still work with, this, with these words. So that's a little bit what helped us, speaking, including all different arts, creating bridges to this, um, I think the word doesn't exist, but it's like something being hermetic. Contemporary art often is very hermetic because you don't know who to speak with, and we often do not have the good organization that include all. Giving it the, the possibility to speak with someone from these art scenes, that helped us a lot. And then addressing the politicians not as our adversaries, but as the first, <coughs> as you just mentioned, it, as the first people that we have to make stronger in their field. I'm completely conscious that works only in a sort of friendly country. If you are in Hungary or Jayosh, what you just said from Poland, especially people that you don't believe, that you know that they will lie to you. This is super, super difficult how to know that. And then also, you can, or this is what worked a little bit, to have the media as partners, but of course it only works if the media are out of control. But yeah, so how will it work in Turkey? How does it work in, in, um, in Hungary? I don't know about Poland, but um, I, I think it's not there yet. Um, so that's a little bit of strategy. Quite friendly environment. Thank you. That was a lot of good tips uh, and tricks, and I think uh, we we can collect more. And I I mean we won't end up 
before I give the, the mic to Anita. We won't end up with the manual today. I, there has been several working groups on advocacy uh, about 10 years ago, and Kaiser this year, he was uh, moderating it some, together with uh, three sessions, I think. Huh? We still have those reports. We, we can start with the recommendations. I think most of them are still valid, unfortunately. Some are definitely new. We add yours. We add yours. We, I, I, I hope you, you both will also con contribute to a publication that is in the making by this type of sessions. So we will have to find you and, and, and help us to construct a manual that won't apply or be applicable for all of us. But at least you can pick out those points that might be helpful in your situation. <coughs> um, I think it's a good moment to uh, end to close the session with uh, Anita de Bade, who is uh, who's working a lot on, uh, on the commission. And uh, I think she can tell a bit about the world of oh. yeah, um, So as, as uh, Nan said, we worked on this paper together. And um, um, I don't, I've heard a lot of interesting things. And uh, as I hear it, there's a lot going on in different countries. So I think that is a very kind of positive movement that is happening. Um, some of the things I would like to respond to as well uh, in what was said by different persons um, and where I think I can also bring in some, some things. Um, you know that the European Commission is the one that can take the initiative. So it's not like in the national member states, it's the parliament that proposes uh, an initiative, it's actually in Europe, it's the Commission. So that's why we are targeting uh, the Commission like in our daily practice. These are several ways how we do it. And we go in that in a very kind of technical manner. There are many opportunities where we can take part through consultations, <coughs> through being part of expert groups, through taking part in stakeholder meetings. And we do that not just uh, at the cultural level, but we do that in many other policy areas because that's the transversal element that we are trying to achieve, like you say also in the parliament, it's not just about culture that we need to focus. There's a lot that you can achieve by other uh, commission services. There's a lot of sympathy that you can gain in other commission services, whether it is those that are working on the digital environment, on employment, on external relations, they are often seeing us a bit like, hey, hang on guys, have I heard of you? Yeah, never thought of you? Hmm, interesting. Um, tourism, also in the parliament, a very active group, but also a group where we hear, when we go to the DJ Enterprise, like, this is interesting, yeah. And here we become instrumental. But what we try to do is speak the language of what they are using. And that I think I heard that also here is about speaking the language that they are using. If it's, I don't mind really, honestly, to call what we do creative content, if it makes them understand what we are talking about. If for them it fits in their box, it's the same thing as if you are explaining to your neighbor who is, uh, what else, a, an engineer, and they say, Nita, what are you doing? Well, I try to explain it, what I'm doing on a daily basis, with the terms that I think an engineer will understand. So that's the kind of process that helps a lot, and that we also apply in any of our conversations, and that brings us forward. Um, I felt a lot of support also in the parliament, Unfortunately, <coughs> not that much in by the culture committee, if I may say so, but by other groups. And uh, one example is uh, a Hungarian politician, SND, <laughs> um, who supported us very much on trying to get a visa through for um, touring artists. And we were so um, yeah, sad that the culture committee decided not to give an opinion on 
what was really targeted as supporting artists for visa, so for obtaining visa when coming to the European Union. And there we felt a lot of support by someone who sits in the tourism committee. So sometimes you, we are looking, and we do that almost in a kind of Machiavellian way, um, who can help us, and if it serves our purposes, why don't we do it? I mean, those that are willing to help and those that are willing to listen, let's go for them. Um, so it's, it's a work that you have to do. It's, it's, being, it's about being, never giving up. It's about saying all the time, let's continue. Okay, today we didn't win the battle, but maybe next time. And that's how we're going to win the war. So uh, this is like what we are saying is never be disappointed. Sometimes you are disappointed and you are kind of skeptical and cynical about things. And I think we should uh, be aware of not becoming cynical and skeptical about it, but continue to, to have our view of what is our target? And we know that this is, in a way, because of the crisis is happening in Europe, this is the right moment to stand up. We see it in the movements, the citizens' movements that are rising <coughs> across Europe. Well, we have to go hand in hand with our citizens' movements because this is how we can, from a grassroots level, can also reach it. There's one other institution that was not mentioned, and because uh, we talked about the local level, there's the Committee of the Regions in Europe. And there also, the Committee of the Regions can be helpful because they can also issue reports. Of course, it's just a report, but with a report you can always say, look, I have got something in hand. The Committee of the Regions, which is a large group of, of delegates from local um, politicians, uh, they can also be supportive in uh, bringing forward our demands. So um, we have to work on so many things and we are with very small teams, so we need to do that all together and I think what Julie is saying is very important that when in your respective countries, and we can easily do that with ITM, circulate who are the members of the parliament in your respective countries, because you're not all the time in Brussels, you're also often in your own uh, borough or um, in your own country. And there you can also meet with members of the parliament and uh, talk to them and bring forward uh, the messages. Because absolutely, um, just in Brussels, it's, it's not only there that it is happening, it's also happening in the respective countries. I just wanted to make one final comment about power uh, or the importance that we need to target, of course, uh, the, the DG culture. Um, there is, um, they have limited powers, that is true. Um, but yet, I mean, you have to have on a constant basis in communication with them, tell what we are doing, keep them updated, etc. Now, where they can actually have some influence is um, at the council level, and there the political body is called the Culture Affairs Committee. Um, so they often refer to that as the CAC. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's there where the political decisions are made, it's there where every six months a presidency will make a certain statement or council conclusions. This year or this half year it's the Dutch presidency. Unfortunately they are not very active on performing arts, they're more focusing on the audiovisual sector. Um, so this is where we can work on in like foreseeing what the next presidency is, what kind of topics uh, they are going to work on. You have to distinct that with something that is often mentioned too the open method of coordination groups, which is a kind of soft power, but it doesn't have a real big political impact. It does it through a kind of process of meeting, which is important, yes, but they are not the ones who are going to give the real decisions. It's the Coach Affairs Committee in which sits other type of persons and people uh, attending uh, open method of coordination groups. 
So this is something, just a kind of uh, theoretical uh, thing that I wanted to bring forward, but uh, don't be misled uh, by those different terms. But we could also perhaps, if that helps, you kind of do a little glossary of who it was. That's what I said. We need uh, to draw the map with all those. Exactly. And, and uh, make it, because yeah. we can all get it on the, on the yeah. website of the culture. Yeah. But it's, it's so complex. Yeah. So to, just to conclude, uh, I think what, what uh, many of you said is, um, and I repeat it again, the language is, uh, is very important. What I think was also said is about building trust. I think this is indeed a possibility or something we can further explore is in setting up more of those meetings. Sometimes national politicians feel more comfortable when they are in an international meeting than that they are having to discuss it at a national level. So they can speak, they have a, a, a bit more freedom to speak or they feel less threatened by being in their national and feeling the, the immediate pressure. So I think this is something we can explore also to get a bit more of those uh, meetings uh, in terms of bringing together uh, national politicians to international meetings. Yeah, that's and um, yeah, I'm just looking for what I kind of circled. I think that's a bit, yeah. That's it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.